Good evening folks, after a bit of a detour via some essays which maybe were a bit political for some taste but historically important I think nevertheless, I'm going to resume with the Holy Book of Thoth by Vladimir Shmakov. We've already done the introduction and the kind of master arcanum, which is the fool, the shin. And I've also read out from the first arcanum, the magician, illustrated with the art, the erg, tarot, which is also featured in the book. So I'll just recap on the end of the magician before we move on to the high priestess. So on the table before the mage stands a cup, a sword and a pentacle and in his raised right hand he holds a rod. These four attributes of the mage speak <clears throat> excuse me, of the eternal manifestations of his power and dignity while the figure himself expresses the idea of substance. Every manifestation of self-sufficient power in our consciousness is known in four aspects, the principles of which are the quaternary. Since ancient times called the quaternary <clears throat> of the four elements, attributes of the magician, they lie on the table, except for the rod that he holds in his hand. They do not constitute its essence, <clears throat> and therefore, gosh, and therefore, I should do this before, shouldn't I? <clears throat> they do not constitute its essence, and therefore they lie outside of it. Only the rod as a symbol of its power and the dignity of the divine is inseparable from it. So that was the end of the magician, Arcanum. Aleph, the number one. Unity, and we'll remember that Arcanum 1 of the Holy Book of Thoth stands above all the other arcana, for it speaks of the first cause of all that exists, of the transition of the Absolute from Pralaya, and the revelation of the active triune deity, <clears throat> and therefore it contains all the principles of the world of manifestation. In this pure nature it is beyond the reach of knowledge, and we must descend from these heights and consider this arcanum in its lower cross section when it is a member of the primus inter pares of the arcana system. <clears throat> now, High Priestess, traditional names Isis, Gnosis, the Sanctuary Gate, Papess, of course. The number associated with her, as you can see at the bottom, is Beth. The numerical designation is 2. I was going to try and show you another nice tarot image from the St. Petersburg Tarot, but it's so mixed up that... Let's have a look. Let's see if I can... Um, I'll close my email, because that always makes a noise. Love as the Empress. You'll see it'll be right in the middle. Oh, high Priestess. There we go. <clears throat> this is from the St. Petersburg Tarot. And I thought that'd be quite nice to show you because it resembles an icon. And that was from this deck by Yuri Shakov. Okay, so symbolically, this is okay.
In front of the massive stone pylon, the entrance to the temple, a woman sits on a smooth, polished cubic stone. Her naked body involuntarily impresses us with its waxy amber translucent colour, its lines are very sharp and in relief. Her legs are tightly clenched together, and her rigid posture with a completely vertical back seems somewhat unnatural. She is wearing gold sandals and a patterned, patterned gold lace around her neck, slightly covering the upper back and chest. In her right hand, pressed to her heart, she holds a roll of papyrus, which lies partly folded in her lap and falls to the steps of her feet. In her left hand, she holds a lotus flower. Her hand is slightly clenched and tightly embraces the stern, the stem. A smoky coloured, slightly transparent veil is thrown over her head. Covering her knees and part of the papyrus, almost completely hiding them from the eyes. On her head she wears a kind of metal helmet. On it are mounted two horns that support the ball. Directly behind the woman, two mighty pillars supporting the portal stand out clearly against the background. Wakim and Boaz, of course, pillars of the temple. About the great mother of all that exists, the divine Isis. How they tremble in the vast universe, how they twist and search for each other, these countless souls that come from the one great soul of the world. They fall from planet to planet and weep in the abyss for the forgotten homeland. These are your tears, Dionysus, O great spirit, O divine deliverer. Take back your daughters to your bosom of unspeakable light. That's an Orphic passage. The absolute universal first cause, the triune universal spirit and its transcendental nature, incomprehensible and ineffable, is known by approaching through the turner of the first three arcana. In its first hypostasis, it is poured out into the cosmic transcendental being and its first attribute, the will, in the second hypostasis. It is projected into the mind as the cosmic transcendental consciousness. Both these hypostases are inseparable, mutually condition each other, and the human mind, deprived of the power to dissect the supreme dilemma of being and consciousness, can only bring the consciousness of the human spirit to its contemplation by its a priori constructions. There's an extract here from Moses Corduero, The Garden of Pomegranates. The first three Sephiroth, the crown, wisdom and reason, must be understood as one and the same thing. The first represents knowledge or science, the second represents the one who knows, and the third represents what is known. In order to explain the, this identity to oneself, one must know that the knowledge of the Creator is not the same as the knowledge of the creatures, for in these latter, knowledge as such is different from the possessor of it and depends on its object, which, in turn, are different from the knower. This is exactly what is explained in three terms. Thought, the one who thinks, and what is thought. Conversely, the Creator is in Himself at the same time, the knowledge and the one who knows and that which is known. In a word, the form of His knowledge does not consist in applying His thought to things that are outside of Him. Knowing in Himself, knowing in Himself, He knows and sees all that is. Nothing exists that is not connected with Him and that He does not find in His own essence. He is the prototype of all that exists, and all things exist in him in their purest and most exhaustively complete forms. Thus the creatures have perfection in this very existence, through which they become united with the source of their being, and as they move away from it, they lose this state, so perfect and so exalted. It's from the Garden of Pomegranates, Moses Cordero.
The transcendental being, the first category of the cosmic spirited being, expresses only the doctrine of extension in the highest abstractness. Extension as such is only a symbol derived from the, from the outset. It outlines only the metaphysical direction, the possibility of reality, but not reality itself. Every reality, even relative reality, must be closed, that is, closed together with the system of its categories and attributes. It must represent a complete, a complete whole, for which it is necessary and sufficient that all the consequences, their mutual relations and reorientations, already implicit, consist in a synthesis corresponding to reality as a possibility. Reality is only closed when the totality of the system of its possibilities, both as a whole and in any parts, can be objectified independently of the outside world. This definition is equivalent to another. The real has a self-sufficient vitality. It is clear that the category of extension does not meet this requirement. It is not endowed with the gift of original generation of attributes. It is not it, it is not reality, but only its primary, but still phenomenal category. Limiting the definition of reality to one category of extension leads logically to self denial, to the replacement of being nirvana as it of being nirvana as it is narrowly understood by Buddhist sectarians. Such is the irony that hangs over them, the highest form of existence, the true and absolute being in its own essence, which is the spirit in the pralaya, can, in the incompleteness of the illumination, be perceived as the absence of existence, as non-existence. Thus it is obvious that in addition to the metaphysical direction of extension, there must be another direction, which, by their mutual intersection in infinity, determines reality. This second metaphysical direction is the transcendental consciousness, wisdom, and the teaching about it is the doctrine of Arcanum II. Being and wisdom affirming each other pour out into the third hypostasis of the cosmic spirit, the divine nature, which is taught by Arcanum III. The Empress. And here we have a quote from Stanislas de Guaita, greatly admired by Meves, um, Shmakov and so many others, who says, The famous Kabbalist Rabbi Simeon ben Yochai tried to explain the original non-existence, or rather, for there could be no beginning in, in the sense commonly believed, the mutual futility of the two dissolved principles, says, non res Isiabat facies ad faciem. Sifra de Zenuta. Yeah. It is necessary that the two faces above should look at each other, and then, and only then, the eternal male and the eternal female will open to each other with a kiss from which being is constantly born. As Orpheus says, Zeus is the husband and the wife are immortal. Or Jupiter, sovereign over kings, worldly affairs and gods, forefather and foremother of the gods. Valerie, so on. The beginningless cosmic spirit, the source creator and originator of all, in the aspect of the Arcana too, translates into the doctrine of divine matter, the great mother of all that exists, the divine Isis, and the absolute truth of the primary body of spirit. You have the three gunas, or attributes, but you are the cause of all the worlds. Even the gods cannot measure the depth of your immeasurable power because of the lack of complete knowledge. You are the support of everything. This whole universe is only a part of you. You are the indivisible first cause, the supreme prakriti. O oh, Divine Mother, you are the supreme science of incomprehensible power 
to which the sages turn, eager for liberation, exalted above weaknesses by taming the inner power of their senses. That's a quote from Sap Tasati. And from the Zohar, like a beauty hidden in the interior of her palace, who as her lover passes, opens for a moment a secret door through which she is visible only to them and disappears again for a long time. The doctrine shows itself only to the chosen ones and is not shown with the same completeness to all the chosen ones. In the beginning, she only makes a sign with her hand in passing and then the point is to see this sign. This is the method called the method of hint. Later she approaches a little closer, whispering a few words, but her appearance is covered with a thick veil through which the eyes cannot penetrate. This is the method called the method of image. Even further she appears before the chosen one with a face covered only with a light veil. This is the method of Agatha. Finally, when he thus becomes accustomed to such communication, she appears before him face to face and reveals to him the secret recesses of her heart. This is the mystical method. The initiate then easily comprehends all those various mysterious truths which are hidden under an external meaning and which can neither be shortened nor supplemented. It's a lovely passage from the Zohar. Absolute truth is pure spirit. They are mutual reflections generating each other. If being is the ultimate truth, then truth is the ultimate being. The human mind becomes silent as it approaches the region of the beginningless light. Whatever it says will be a limitation, a blurring of existence, and therefore it is filled with a trembling silence. In this realm of light, only the spirit itself can draw, everything else freezes. In the contemplation of being and truth, there is a bottomless ocean of beauty, but it can only be sung, for no words dare to express the language. Sibella, Sibella, great mother, hear me. The primordial light, the ethereal flame that flares forever in the boundless spaces in which the echoes and images of all things are hidden. I call upon your shining messengers, O soul of the universe, who warms the abysses, who sows the suns, who drags her star-spangled mantle in the ether, the subtlest light, hidden and invisible to the eyes of the Buddha, the great mother of all worlds and gods, who keeps all the primordial images, images in her bosom. It's from the Phrygian Mysteries. And from the Book of the Wisdom of Solomon. Wisdom is more mobile than any movement, and in its purity it passes through and penetrates everything. It is the breath of the power of God and the pure outpouring of the glory of the Almighty. Therefore nothing defiled will enter into it. It is the reflection of pure light and the pure mirror of God's action and the image of his goodness. It is one, but it can do everything and being in itself, it renews everything. Ahura Mazda means being is wisdom. The consciousness of the spirit is the self-contemplation of reality, the self-consciousness of its own being. The pure spirit in its being contains an infinite number of potencies. Its individual aspects, various phases of being, corresponding to various relative limitations. The reality of being, while absolutely primary in its very transcendental nature, is also primary in the order of synthesis. Each individual aspect's being an attribute of reality determines and is conditioned by a corresponding mode of consciousness. The consciousness of the spirit as a whole refers to these modes as substance to attributes. Thus, being in consciousness, hypostasis of a single reality, although homogeneous in principle, but at the same time contain the possibility of the birth of the principle of creation. This possibility of creation is expressed 
in the consciousness of the spirit in a sense of its profundity. The spirit, although it is aware of itself as homogeneous, it at the same time feels all the multiplicity of its synthetic being, the consciousness of individual modes, although they form, merging together, a single harmony, yet they layer the whole consciousness with a sense of potential diversity. Arcanum 2 is a teaching of the inner nature of the cosmic consciousness of the universal spirit. She lives in herself, she contemplates her being, and thus gives birth to the divine nature. Just as the first hypostasis of this deity is expressed in our consciousness as the principle of will, which is synonymous with substantiality, so the second hypostasis is the divine self-consciousness. Thought and reason are only stages and consequences of contemplation and self-consciousness. That is why the divine Isis, as the beginning of consciousness, is at the same time the beginning of the absolute mind and of thinking, the imprinted mind which is the source of relative being of the universal illusion or maya. Eternal, unchangeable, pure, all-pervading, all-seeing. The Supreme Spirit dreams of the external form and thus creates the quality of his maya from the Bhagavata Purana. The universal spiritual consciousness, the Great Mother, the Divine Isis, is one and indivisible. When the Spirit began to manifest through the Triune Creative Deity, the Great Mother poured out into the principle of eternal truth and absolute wisdom. She is one, a pure outpouring of unspeakable light, and at her very birth, she was already divinely perfect, like Pallas Athena, who emerged fully armed from the head of Jupiter. When the Great Spirit filled space with waves of its rays that pierced the darkness, creating myriads of worlds, it continued to reign in the universe, bright, pure and perfect. Not for a moment did she stand still in the stillness of death. She mourned the destruction of the whole, her divine spouse. She experienced all the twists of the life of every spirit, every movement of the soul of every being. She remained undivided in her great whole and, floating in the vast expanses of the universe, she carefully gathers together the remains of her husband and weaves from his fragments a majestic appearance. Nothing is eternal in the world. Everything appears only for a moment. Everything disappears to shine again with a short existence and again melt into the depths of time. She alone is eternal. Everything changes. The forms of the universe are eternally varied. Individual souls are perfected or fall down again. She alone is unchangeable in her royal calm. And on the path of the ages, from the clear silence of the breath of the mountains and the blue sea of the Holy Land, India far away, through the hot sands of the Valley of Osiris, under the dark cedars of Syria languid, to the wonderful shores of the land of the Hellenes. A song was poured out. Hymns thundered in honour of the god Lyra and the sun, who died torn to pieces. In the stillness of the night, by the torches of the mysteries, his great spirit was evoked there, and tears were shed there for his divine friend. Wandering through the world, collecting with a caring hand the remains of her brother and husband, Isis the Shining is the avenger of her brother. She is always looking for him. And with a cry he wanders through this world, not knowing peace until he finds it. That's a hymn to Osiris from the 18th dynasty of Egypt, 1500 BC. <laughs> Everywhere it is a god slain, torn and dismembered by giants. The goddess searches for him and goes around the world in search of him, and when she goes around him, she gives laws, customs, founds cities, gives science, arts, worship and rituals. And the slain god, torn to pieces by the giants, after many battles and sufferings, rises again and finally arrives triumphant and victorious. In Phrygia, it is Sibeli, inconsolable by the infidelity of Attis who runs around the world in anger, 
and forces Atis to disfigure himself in despair at the betrayal she has suffered from him. In Egypt, it is Isis in despair at the death of Osiris, who was slain treacherously by Typhon, who forced him to try on his coffin and torn to pieces by the giants. Isis goes around the world to collect these pieces. She collects them all, except the phallus, to which she dedicates her image, while she gives laws, arts and worship everywhere. And Osiris, after many battles and labours, is the winner of Typhon and the giant, is the winner of Typhon and the giants, and is reborn for the happiness of the world. In Phoenicia, it is Venus, inconsolable from the death of Adonis, killed by the cruel Mars. She searches the world to find his body, but Adonis is finally intimidated by this hideous animal, and is reborn victorious, comforting Venus. In Assyria, these are Salambo and Belus, with which the same thing happens. In Persia, it is Mithras and Mithras. In Scandinavia, it is Freya and Baldur, with a similar history. In Samothrace, in Troy, in Greece, in Rome, the Ceres, inconsolable from the induction of her daughter, travels throughout the universe and is comforted only when she sees the abyss through which Pluto took Prosperpine, Persephone. This is Bacchus, slain, torn by giants, whose trembling heart is found by Pallas, whose body parts are collected by Ceres or Demeter, who fills the world with his exploits, remains victorious and wins his place among the gods. Eurydice, O divine light, said Orpheus, dying. Eurydice, the seven strings of his lyre groaned, breaking off, and his head, carried away forever by the stream of time, continues to call, Eurydice, Eurydice. It's an Orphic hymn. This call, this cry, for the torn god, resounded throughout the ancient world, and resulted in the creation of divine mysteries in the glory of Osiris, Dionysus and Attis. The echo of the Eleusinian mysteries, the mysteries of Samothrace, has reached our days, and the ancient idea of a torn god and an undivided eternal truth has been reflected in the fact that modern Freemasons, who consider themselves successors of the ancient initiations, call themselves children of the widow, as Illuminism. So that's quite a lot already, and I've only read um, four or five pages, or four pages. So I think I'll do the second part as a separate reading, and that's going to be on the passive, um, the world passive principle. So instalment two coming up.